can't. Uh, okay. Because my mouse didn't work anymore before of this. Uh, uh, So let's start. Welcome everybody, the, the, all the people who are here uh, who has joined us uh, on the Zoom link and all the people who are on the YouTube channel following us uh, in this celebration of the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. I want to start with the number uh, 258. And uh, this is um, a measure uh, represent the number of years um, that we need to reach uh, uh, gender equity in science and to fill the gap between uh, uh, the male and female presence in science. It has been calculated in uh, 2021, so it is very recent and uh, taking into account 15 million authors, 36 million papers, 6,000 journals, 15 years, and 100 countries. And uh, this is a lot of time. It is uh, more than eight generations of people, and I don't think that we want to wait so long. So let's push the change and uh, the celebration of this day, even if it is just symbolic, it is a way to do it. I am Simona Cerrato, and I'm a communications and community manager and at EXA. And I'm very happy to celebrate this day with all of you. And uh, of course, uh, we have uh, this day a very informal session, a storytelling session of 13 different uh, uh, stories told by and shared by people who are representative and protagonists of the citizen science uh, uh, community. And citizen science, is, it's a very powerful way of uh, empowering people and especially people who are not yet, uh, who have not yet uh, enough uh, um, represent representation in the public sphere. Public sphere. And so uh, we decided to have this uh, um, storytelling uh, session. Um, we have 13 people and the first uh, person who is uh, sharing her story is uh, Huma Shah and uh, I gave the floor to her without any much ado and I stopped sharing my screen. Welcome uh, uh, Huma. Thank you. Um, so good morning everybody. Um, I'm hoping you're going to be able to see my screen uh, shortly when I share it. So. Um, I am Huma, so I um, teach AI ethics. I have a PhD in cybernetics. I also um, co-lead an EU citizen science funded project. My question today is, do we need gendered robots? So this is a picture from Maria in uh, Fritz Lang's uh, movie Metropolis, 1927. Um, so going to Silicon Valley one year for a conference, I noticed that they had um, robots in the airport guiding you on information on where things were. Why did it have a female face? Um, is it because female face is most trustworthy? Female uh, bots or female gendered, virtual gendered bots have been used in uh, e-commerce. So there is a book about this, which I highly recommend. Um, what uh, this book showed that in robot labs, the roboticists are mainly males. So they're deciding on the gender of robots. So I think we need more women in STEM, more women in robotics. So I'm handing over to Alice Shepard at UCL. Thank you. Alice, you are muted. Huma, thank you so much. I'm Alice Shepard at UCL, and I just have my, my personal journey into science to tell you. As a small child, I learned from books that I love the planets and the stars. As a schoolgirl, I learned from lessons that maths and physics were not my strong point and that teachers wanted me to focus on art subjects and writing. As a university student, I learned that I was not good at science because my writing was too much like popular science and there was no way that I could ever get high grades. As a 25 year old, I discovered what science was by accident. 
In 2007, the Galaxy Zoo project asked the public to classify galaxies by shape. Galaxies are giant cities of stars in space. Every galaxy has a slightly different shape and they are incredibly beautiful. I learned that thousands of people wanted to learn about galaxies. I was asked to help run the discussion forum where these people asked questions and began to make discoveries, including of new types of astronomical object. I learned from all these people how to really do science. I began to give talks about Galaxy Zoo and how anyone can do science, not just professors. In 2015, I was invited to give a talk in Zurich where I met Moki Hackley. He runs a research group in London called the Extreme Citizen Science. I asked for some work experience and from that I got a job. I've learned a huge amount about how universities and the public can do research in many ways and I also teach students and other researchers about how to run citizen science communities like I did. I suppose there are many ways to get into science, even if they tell you you're no good at it. And I'm handing over to Jim Lear. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Hi, everyone. My name is Jim Lear Nadez de Mendoza from Kaposkari University in Venice. And I'm, I'm from a family of the fishermen. Um, I'm from this, uh, the biggest lake in the Philippines, which is Laguna Lake. I received a full scholarship in Jim Lea disappeared, I think. So by studying the courses oh. at my university, uh, by working um, with people from the Biocultural Diversity Lab, mostly women, led by Professor Renata, and then with us, Julia, Baiba, and Christina, also from the storytelling group. And from the support of many local collaborators in my home country, led by my family, Amy, Amelia, and Harvey, with the support, guidance from a lot of other scientists um, inside and outside Kaposkari, like Sophia. With their help, we conducted the research project with the involvement of the local partners, such as the fishermen, or the government unit starting from the local community up to the regional level, which also the public high school and the concerned agency about fishermen. So with all of them, with all of these experiences up to now, I'm so motivated in how the citizen science approaches are very helpful in exploring the local ecological knowledge of fishermen in these regions and how it could contribute uh, to help for the sustainable management of these regions, which are vulnerable to this changing environment. It is what I really become passionate about, and this is how I would like to contribute service for the environmental management of these regions. So this moment is also to celebrate for many women and people who's been working with me, inspiring with me ever since. So cheers to women in science. Now I hand over to, it's time for Enrico. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jimla. So I'm Enrico Valli, uh, beside being the vice chair of uh, the European Citizen Science Association. Uh, professionally, I'm the chief um, communication officer of the European Plate Observing System that is one of the largest European research uh, infrastructures. Today, um, I would like to uh, talk about uh, what has been, in my opinion, a very nice uh, example of an action that could uh, possibly change the number of years that we have to wait until we uh, reach a gender uh, balance in, um, in science. Uh, as many of you probably remember, uh, some uh, two years ago, we organized the EXA conference in, um, in Trieste. Uh, then, for some obvious uh, reasons, uh, the conference um, was moved uh, online. Uh, but uh, uh, we decided since the very beginning that uh, this conference uh, would have uh, needed uh, some real action in terms of uh, gender balance and gender equality. And uh, we decided to uh, have uh, the conference program uh, committee gender balanced. So we had exactly 50% male and 50% female um, members of the um, conference program uh, committee. And without adopting uh, any kind of a uh, uh, quota, um, when we reviewed all of the proposals, I think that uh, this um, good and fair composition of the um, 
of the um, of this uh, group of people that actually reviewed all of the the proposals has brought to a majority of uh, female authors that have been accepted for the conference so if you look at the program that is still online you can see that more than 60 percent of the presenters um, at the, the conference were actually women um, and uh, we had uh, really a large number of um, of, uh, of talks uh, one exactly 100 the uh, split between uh, uh, keynotes, uh, talks, uh, posters, uh, and so on. And possibly as a consequence of the program that was uh, um, gender balanced, we also had a majority of attendees at our conference. And I think that uh, sometimes with just a small decision, you can really have an impact on uh, the reality. So uh, that's all. And now it's time to hand over to Claire. Thank you very much, Enrico. Um, my name is Claire Murray. I work at EXA and I am very excited to be here today. When Indigenous peoples first tracked the stars across the sky and shared this knowledge with their community, the delineation between science and citizen science was perhaps not so clear. I wonder about the women and girls who shared their expertise. Their theories and their observations have shaped centuries of scientific research, and yet we know little to nothing about them. We can say the same thing centuries later in the 1800s, when many women were actively excluded from the formal scientific process. We may not always know their names, but their discoveries and their findings still survive due to the principles of citizen science. Fast forward another two centuries, and we now live in a time of strange juxtapositions. Everything has changed and nothing has changed. Women are thriving with creativity and excellence in all types of citizen science, but we are still fighting against systems and structures that continue to exclude them and many others who are underserved and underrepresented. We now know their names, but the very fact that today is the International Day of Women and Girls in Science means equality and equity are not a given in 2022. So please remember, we must persist in creating equal space and opportunities. We must resist doing it as it always has been done because everyone deserves the right to exist within citizen science. Thank you very much. I'll pass over to Annette. Annette, you're muted. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you can see this picture. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to share my very personal story about our daughter and our daughter, how she was involved in parts of my PhD and how this involvement in engaging in science as a very young, uh, hopefully future scientist, um, made her aware of the little tiny things. And I'm reading the story. Uh, between 2005 and 10, we lived as a family in Canberra in Australia, where I was fortunate to receive a PhD scholarship from the University of Canberra. And I performed my PhD there together with a lot of young female scientists. And um, in these years, I was very much inspired by the very strong sense of community and sense of place by so many people in Australia who cared about the environment and the nature and the species of plants and animals. So for me as a very young scientist, I decided to integrate citizen science in my PhD. And uh, as you do as a mom with a little one, uh, she was uh, three years old at this time, I took her to the field anytime uh, I had to, I was needed to bring her to, to the field, but also when she wanted. So in fact, she was part of my community citizen science project in Australia. She was there when we observed the species. She was there when we even did the training sessions for the community. So while being extremely busy with coordinating, initiating and running my own citizen science project in Australia, I often came home with scribbles on my hands to remind me of the very important to do's. 
So one day we were together in the field with my daughter and the volunteers. And one, one woman was extremely immersed with observing the golden sun moth. This was our species. And our daughter looked at her and suddenly she turned around her head and she screamed out loudly, mommy, this lady has scribbles on her hands. She must do a PhD with volunteers as you do. And this situation made us laugh so loud because we realized how observative she was. And when she associated being a woman in the, in the field with others, with volunteers and having scribbles on her hands. So many years later, we still allocate people with scribbles on their hands as PhD students doing PhDs with volunteers. So I hope with that story, I encourage you as mothers, as female scientists, as family members to involve kids at a very early, early stage. And I congratulate all those who already are being part of citizen science and research. Thank you very much. And Jessica, can you stop uh, sharing your screen? I pass on to Jessica, yes. I don't have anything to share on my screen. Um, so Annette, I'm, sorry, uh, can you stop can sharing your screen? Stop sharing. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. There we okay, go. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Jessica Wardlaw. I am Citizen Science Program Developer at the Natural History Museum in London. However, I'm speaking to you today from Dorset on the southern coast of England, where we have a huge array of um, fossils. And I'm gonna use this context to explain to you what citizen science means to me and the Natural History Museum's citizen science program more broadly. So Lyme Regis is a small town that's famous for being the home of Mary Anning, who was a leading fossil hunter of her time in the early 19th century. Despite no wealth and little education, she collected the fossilized skeletons of ancient sea creatures in the cliffs and knew more about geology and fossils than most people at the time. Although her finds were often displayed in museums, she was rarely credited with their discovery and never allowed to publish their scientific description because of her sex, class and religion. Male scientists who frequently bought the fossils that Mary uncovered, cleaned, prepared and identified often did not credit her discoveries in their scientific papers on the finds, even when they wrote about her groundbreaking ichthyosaur find. Anning's discoveries have since proven to be key links in reconstructing the history of life on Earth. And today at the Natural History Museum in London, um, we showcase several of Mary Anning's spectacular finds, including her ichthyosaur, plesiosaur, and pterosaur. And it's Mary Anning's story that continues to inspire me today and as a, an early citizen scientist especially given that I grew up so close to her home. So the Natural History Museum's mission is to create advocates for the planet by engaging and involving the widest possible audience, including those who, like Mary Anning, are underrepresented in science. Citizen science can open studying and working in science to all backgrounds, perspectives and experiences and maximizes innovation and creativity in science for the benefit of the planet. Our program embeds and demonstrates best practices in citizen science to enable the public to collaborate with scientists and develop their identity and sense of agency with respect to science. We are proud to share our experiences and knowledge as members of the EU Citizen Science Consortium in the spirit of open citizen science. And I pass back to Simona now on behalf of Barbara. Thank you. And uh, I share the screen to um, share with you the story of Barbara. Barbara sent me this story and uh, the power of role models. 
Many studies have shown how important role models can be for personal development of young people. A role model can be inspiring and provoke self-enhancement. During my work in citizen science, I have, a, I have experienced situations that confirm the encouragement a female role model can have on other women, and especially younger ones. In a recent project, we were, for example, showing the potential of low-cost air quality sensors for environmental monitoring to school classes in rural areas. We saw that girls were especially motivated when the technology was presented by female researchers. This was just a very short incidence, but the power of role models is much greater. They can transfer their passion for something to others and help them to understand their own values and beliefs. We should not forget to be role models ourselves. Thank you. Thank you to you and thank you to Barbara for sharing this story uh, with us, even though she was not able to be personally uh, with us today. And I pass on to uh, Rosa, that means uh, to Nora. Nora, it's your turn. Thank you so much. Good morning to everyone. Um, the story I will tell is uh, related actually to these uh, role models that you were mentioning. So my name is Nora salas -Ewane. I am the Human Resources and Emotional Care Manager at Science for Change. And I also under undertake social research within the women's health domain nowadays. I am today presenting on behalf of Rosa Arias, who is the CEO and founder of Science for Change, also an ex board member who finally cannot be here with us. Science for Change uh, is a startup that was born to tackle social, environmental, and health challenges affecting communities using citizen science and participatory strategies. The company has had a strong commitment since its inception to defend and promote the role of women and girls in science. This starts uh, from within, and for us was very important to create a multicultural and transdisciplinary team, which we are super proud of, to be composed mostly of incredible, great professional women. The story I would like to tell today is about how women and girls have been involved in monitoring others in affected communities by other issues. Rosa worked for a long time as another expert, realizing that the people affected were not involved in measuring the problem. As a chemical engineer in a mostly men's world, she also lived in first-person experiences women's inequalities in science. Thus, she created the app Other Collect uh, that was born to give voice to citizens affected by other pollution problems, and also with the idea to increase the participation of women and girls in scientific matters. Today, OtterCollect has more than uh, 1,800 users globally with more than 10,000 observations, 70% of which are made by female. Uh, one of the reasons of this um, is that uh, we have conducted many, many participatory activities to promote STEM careers amongst girls and women and letting girls and women experience in first person how they can participate in real scientific research or also being models ourselves as uh, Simona was telling before. So this is uh, for us a great feeling of fulfillment and we hope to keep contributing to inspire more girls and improve the scenario of women in science. Thank you very much. Hello, Sorry, everyone. that's a word to Francoise, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, François Drost. I'm a project officer at EXA, and today I'm going to talk about women in participatory action research. During my uh, doctoral research in the Peruvian Andes, many women scientists have uh, guided me since uh, the very inception uh, of uh, my uh, research process. But it was only at the beginning, when I was in the field, that I realized the central role that women uh, play in uh, participatory actual research. They were present and active in every single method I used that, uh, and was used in the field. From community workshops to in-depth interviews to climate change and land use mapping to yield measurement and even to uh, transit walks. Women largely uh, turned into informants, researchers, and teachers, 
making it possible to produce collective knowledge coming up uh, with sustainable alternatives to climate uh, change issues. And it, be, it is because of that, actually, that now that I have a daughter uh, who is uh, five, every night uh, during the past uh, two years, among other books, I have been reading this, uh, heard this book. I don't know if you can see it, it uh, which I find very special. It's uh, Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls, written by uh, Elena Favilli and Francesca Cavallo, and has a uh, uh, hundred tales of extraordinary women, not only politician or uh, sports woman, but also many uh, scientist women, woman scientists from Jade Golo to uh, Mary Curie, and even uh, the paleontologist uh, Mary Anning that we're uh, talking about before, and who have uh, played an important, uh, who have had an important impact shaping our world and will always have. And that is why I want to bring this role of woman in science closer to her. Thank you very much. And now I uh, give the floor to Janice. Hello, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I am Janice Ansign. I'm Senior Project Manager for Citizen Science at the Open University in the UK. Um, I am also chair of one of the EXO working groups around sharing best practices. Now, I've had a career that spanned engagement and, and media and citizen science um, over a number of years. And at the Open University over the past 13 years, it has given me the opportunity to, 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 to work on a number of projects that are very embracing of not only citizen science practices, but also engagement, practical science skills, and so on. And I've been able to bring this sort of a approach, um, integrated approach, blended approach in the projects that I manage and integrate. And so I'm able to, to, to develop best practices from one to, to another and to another. And I want to talk very briefly about one particular project that I'm very excited about that we've been doing over the past couple of years called the Open STEM Africa project. Now this project is working in Ghana where we're supporting teaching and learning of practical science in senior high schools. And this is a very significant because one of the key goals of this project is to encourage girls to study science and give them the opportunity to, to do so and hopefully embrace STEM related careers. So the OU has um, expertise in distance learning. That's what we do. And we embrace this in practical science and citizen science as well. And we're actually incorporating these approaches in, the, in creating a virtual lab and, and other tools for teachers and the students themselves. Now, um, before the, the pandemic, we were able to do, I was able to do quite a few visits to Ghana. And one of the things that, st that stemmed in my mind, and I'll, and I'll end with this bit of a story, is we were doing um, discussions and workshops with teachers and students. And we went to this particular school and I was chatting with some of the girls um, in the lab after. And when I asked her, you know, what, 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 what encourages her to get involved in STEM? And she told me about, you know, people, women who she knows. And she said to me, and people like you. So it's very important to know that you don't realize sometimes just the impact you can have by just being there as a presence, but also the impact that role models and strong female role models in science and STEM can have in encouraging other young people to get into this area. So just a word to say that you may not realize that you're becoming a role model, but you actually are. And the more we, 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 we develop this area and do more in this area, the more impact we can have. Thank you. I hand over now to Elge. I think. Uh, we skipped uh, Skip. by mistake uh, in Niona, so we we have Niona now and then okay. Egle. So no no problem at all. I think we are all here. And Egle, you have the last place of the most honoured one. So. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Niona from Arue, and uh, I would love to share a story about Tracy, um, who is one of our beneficiaries that has benefited from one of the science, science vocational skilling that we've been doing. So Tracy is a 19 year old and um, she stays with her two parents. And um, I don't know if, if, if I'm being heard, um, yes, we can hear you. 
Oh, yes. Um, yes, so I uh, saying that Tracy stays with her two parents and has seven younger siblings. And uh, her family does subsistence agriculture for a living. So usually that doesn't produce a lot of money. So that led to her dropping out of school at a very young age, because she dropped out in 2019. And issues were proposed to her to get married, but um, that was put aside because the family actually had to earn an income. She was asked to get a job by her parents at a restaurant, but she, however, she experienced sexual harassment as there were many advances, both verbal and physical, by older men that wanted to pursue her because of their sexual desires. Um, she was very, very frustrated, but she later on met um, a railway staff that actually came to her aid um, to just um, support her. Uh, they built her confidence, which she had lost uh, recently, and they they trained her in life skills and and other other things. All right, so we they also trained her um, in how to on how to repair phones because this was a field that lacked a lot of women. So we, uh, as Aruba, we definitely thought that this uh, would be very, very important um, in just bridging that gap in technology. So we, we, when, she, when she actually started the phone repair, uh, she, she became a leader because of the programs that, that we were taking her through. So she was leading the 15 girls in that program. And later on when the trainings had ended, Tracy actually came out and joined efforts with two other trainees in, that were in the same program and they started up a kiosk where they repair phones uh, currently and they also sell phone accessories. So this has been a very one of the success stories that we've had as Arua and we continue to support girls like this um, just so that we can bridge that gender gap really when it comes to science. So thank you, thank you so much. And um, it's been Niona. I would love to pass this on to Ego. Hello, everybody. I'm very excited to uh, be here and to share actually the story of women teachers uh, who are engaging uh, their students into citizen science. Uh, I'm Agla Butkavichina from uh, Kaunas University of Technology. Uh, I'm professor there, and I led a project uh, on citizen science as an innovative way to uh, engage uh, citizens into the Lfia society building. During this project, while we were implementing this, pro uh, this project, we had a series of interviews with uh, a lot of stakeholders. And one of the uh, group of stakeholders, their teachers, women teachers. And uh, that's why I decided to share this story today with you, because I think um, these women are changing our society. Uh, you can take your uh, job in a standard way, but these women, uh, these teachers, uh, they are not doing this, uh, not in an easy way. They are doing their job in a creative, innovative way. They are engaging their young uh, students, um, school children into citizen science projects. And uh, as far as I found from the interviews, uh, all the families sometimes join to citizen science. And I think it is a, a very uh, important thing to change society, to start uh, introducing citizen science uh, in a, a primary school. And uh, this gives a great potential to change our society. So that's why I wanted to highlight the work of uh, these brilliant women who are doing their job, not in, in a regular, but innovative and uh, engaging way. Thank you. And I pass a uh, word to Simone again. Yes, I just uh, want to wrap up and thank you everybody for sharing this uh, empowering and inspiring stories of determination and liberation. Uh, we should mainstream uh, gender equity in all our actions and thinking and projects and program and language and embrace uh, gender equity really in uh, our day life uh, and in our professional life. So thank you everybody and uh, let's uh, keep continuing and uh, promoting gender equity and fighting for a better recognition of women in all 
um, public spheres and uh, uh, of culture, science, uh, work, uh, business, and whatever. Thank you again. Have a nice day, and uh, Thank you. see you next time. Okay. Thank you for organizing. Thank you, Exa, for organizing. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Have a Thank good you. day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Have a great Bye. day. Bye. 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 What do I press now to stop the YouTube stream?